My name is Sam Backus. I'm with Perimed. We're the ones who manufactured this laser Doppler instrument. And I want to start with a short presentation uh, going over a little bit about the company, laser Doppler theory. Dr. Ewan already touched uh, on that, but we'll go over that in a little more, bit more detail. And then we'll take a look at the machine itself and all the specifics, setting it up for use, and, and, and continue on identifying potential issues, uh, maintenance, and so on and so forth. So Perimed, a uh, Swedish company, here's the headquarters in Stockholm, Sweden. This is where the machines are being manufactured uh, and developed. And here in the US, we have sales and, and training and customer support. And I'm the, the regional rep uh, here. Uh, when it comes to laser Doppler, technology came about in the early 80s, and that's also when Pyramid was founded around this technology uh, as a way of, of essentially measuring microcirculatory blood perfusion. Uh, we do have a few different options using this technology. The monitoring system we have here, uh, which we call the 5000 system, there's also another uh, 6000 system on the market more for uh, other clinical applications, I should say. We do have imager systems as well, uh, which can scan perfusion over an area. Uh, when it comes to uh, laser Doppler technology, it is a little bit slower and a little bit trickier, uh, and you don't get quite the time response you do get from a monitoring uh, system like the one we have here. So getting those uh, immediate reactions to certain uh, issues or potential flat problems, the monitoring system is, is great for that. Laser Doppler uh, measures the total local microcirculatory perfusion, so it's not a specific vessel or group of vessels, but you get in skin, for example, typically. The contribution to the signal comes from capillaries, arterioles, venules, and shunting vessels. Uh, we cannot distinguish just one specific vessel or vessel type, but uh, as Dr. Yuan showed earlier, we can certainly measure invasively and buried flaps, for example, and non-invasive you know, skin measurements. Uh, laser Doppler, what we're doing to how we're actually measuring this blood perfusion and changes in blood perfusion is for uh, sending laser light into the tissue in question. This is done with like a fiber optic probe, such as this one right here. The probe has a transmitting fiber, so the laser source within the instrument is then being transmitted fiber optically to the tissue. The laser light will scatter in the tissue, some of it's absorbed, some of it scatters away from the probe, but part of it will will scatter and bounce around and come back to a, a receiving fiber uh, at that, uh, in that probe, uh, part of the light's going to hit moving red blood cells. And as the light is hitting moving red blood cells, it will undergo a Doppler frequency shift. And so the lights coming back to the machine and the receiving fiber will be a mix of non-shifted light, meaning light that's hitting non-moving tissue, cell walls, and so on, for example and a portion that does have a Doppler shift to the signal. So, uh, so putting this quite simply, what the machine does is looking at two things. One is the ratio of shifted and non-shifted light. And this ratio tells us about the concentration of moving blood cells in that measured volume. And uh, secondly, we look at the shifted portion, what the amplitude of that frequency shift is. Uh, on average, and this tells us about the velocity of these uh, blood cells. So combining these two, we get what we call perfusion, perfusion units. Um, number of uh, moving blood cells in the measured volume and the mean velocity of, of, of those blood cells. Uh, perfusion or perfusion units that the instrument will show on, uh, on the display it is an arbitrary unit, uh, which means I can't translate this to a standardized milliliter per minute per hundred gram tissue, for example. Uh, and the reason for this comes from the optical characteristics of the tissue and how that, those characteristics can be very different depending on where on the body, what type of tissue, 
and also from uh, individual to individual, meaning we cannot predetermine the exact measure depth or measure volume. However, thanks to calibration device and calibration fluids, we can ensure that each machine will measure in a standardized way and measure the same, give you the same reading on the exact same tissue. So you can compare the results from two different units, units for example. And we know that the signal is linear, meaning when you see a 50% drop in your laser doppler signal, that does correspond to a 50% drop of the actual blood perfusion in that measured tissue. So uh, looking at that relative change is a good method of having a you know, good, reliable, and, and sometimes repeatable way of, of comparing and, and analyzing your, your measurements. Uh, in skin, uh, typical measurement depth is about half to one millimeter. So this, again, more or less determines that what we're measuring is, in, in fact, microcirculatory blood perfusion. Uh, there's quite a few uh, parameters to, that can affect this microcirculatory perfusion and, in turn, the laser Doppler measurement. Uh, temperature, especially when we're talking about skin, very, very powerful influence. If we measure on on my fingertip, for example, if I'm freezing and, and cold and, and I experience that constriction from the cold, and then later on I warm up and you know maybe I grab a cup of hot coffee for, for a few minutes and we measure on the exact same spot five minutes later, and temperature being the only real difference, you can in some cases in skin see a thousand percent difference in the level of blood perfusion. So quite a, quite a bit of dynamic oftentimes, especially in skin, uh, just from a temperature-related influence. Uh, blood pressure, again, uh, just as Dr. Yuan mentioned earlier, you know, if you see a 50% or 30% drop in your laser doppler signal, you might want to, to compare that with any systemic changes during that same time frame see if you have a blood pressure drop that's about the same scale doesn't necessarily mean that you have a, a, a flap issue or a microcirculatory problem at, at that case. Uh, other than that, uh, diet, food, medication, certainly uh, smoking and, and so on, you'll see again a bit of effect uh, or influence on the microcirculation. And, and as much as can be managed in terms of uh, either controlling and stabilizing or standardizing, uh, the better the repeatability will be for this measurement if you come back from one day to the next, for example. So uh, while we do have quite a bit of dynamics, there's also uh, oftentimes spatial variations depending on where this probe is placed, you may see a, a bit of difference in your perfusion readings. If you happen to come up on a, a cluster of open capillaries, for example, or a very dense, densely uh, circulated uh, part of the skin, move it over a little bit and it might drop off, for example. Uh, so what we typically recommend doing in terms of overcoming these variations is we're looking at some kind of provocation or some kind of um, some kind of challenge that we can control. And now in this case, we are looking at flaps and, and and plastic surgery. So that's a great way of having a you know definitely looking at change over time that way. And I just wanted to quickly show. I think this might even be. Um, related from some of the early works on, on buried flaps using just this one uh, laser doppler probe and how it can be applied in, in, in such scenarios. So that's the my uh, short PowerPoint presentation on laser doppler. Any questions at this time? All right, so the instrument itself, if you move over to, to the machine, this is uh, the Periflex 5000 instrument. 
it does come with a couple of manuals. Um, extended user manual is probably the one to go to. Uh, one good thing about the machine itself is it doesn't really require any maintenance or regular uh, checkup from, let's say, Biomed or, or end user besides vocational laser doppler probe calibration, which we'll go over shortly. So the machine itself, power cord plugged in on the back, power switch is right above where the power cord plugs in. We have a laser Doppler module here on the front of, of the machine. This is where the fiber optic probe is then attached. Laser Doppler module has three buttons here on the side. The bottom one is a simple active or deactive, uh, uh, deactivation of this module. And it also functions as an alarm reset. If for some reason the machine will give you an alarm, that bottom button be the one to, to silence the alarm. One thing to make a note of though, when it comes to alarms, if you do experience the alarm, the machine will beep and there will be a code presented on the display. So before you silence and reset the alarm, please make a note of that code to then later on reference the manual and see exactly what that means. And of course, that's also a perfect time to get in touch with Paranet and support or will assist in any do potential you have a, troubleshooting. A digital manual that we can save? Certainly. Okay. Yeah. Uh, calibration button, this uh, is what we have here on top. This is used to then calibrate uh, the laser Doppler probes. I would recommend if the opportunity is there to, if you ever do swap probes to the same machine, to you, you unplug this probe, maybe perhaps send it to be sterilized plug a different probe in to then calibrate that probe at that time. You, you may see some optical differences from probe to probe, even if they are the same model. So I need to do per use calibration? But you don't typically need to, to recalibrate or change calibration, even if, if you come back with the same probe. We're going to have three probes that recycle or cycle okay. through. Yeah. So then probably not a bad idea to calibrate. Uh, the center button, by the way, is what we call time constant. This uh, does, re not, does not really carry any effect in this case when we look at the numbers right here on the display of the machine. But if you would ever at some point connect the machine to our software, which could then keep our running recording, for example, it will have an impact on how the graph and how the the values are transmitted to the instrument. So it's a, it's a moving filter, a moving average where you can have a completely unfiltered signal. You can have a, a minor filter which still allows you to pick up harsh pulsations where you can really smooth it out completely. Uh, I recommend keeping it on point two and that should be that should be fine for these applications. So the probe itself you have two connectors. You have the the red, which is for the transmitting fiber, and the black, which is the receiving side. The instrument itself, the connectors for the probe, have this little colored key uh, right there, the red key, so you know where these connectors go to. To insert the probe properly in the machine, uh, for the red side, the transmitting side, you have to rotate this connector around a little bit until you feel it slide all the way into the to the receptor and then you push the outer casing here out this shows up on the video uh, twist it sideways and it will lock on these pins here on the receptor sides this, I think it's called a bayonet type fitting uh, the receiving side a little bit easier you plug it straight in and again that bayonet type of connection now what the display shows now is three L's in red, which stands for low light level. So this is what we see typically when the probe is not connected. Low light level essentially means that there's no light being reflected back in the transmitting fiber to the instrument. But as soon as I put this probe now up against my skin, we're seeing numbers in green. And this is what you would then typically see during that monitoring phase. You'll have numbers showing up here in green on the display. 
and you will find, just like Dr. Yuan said, that when you're on a certain type of, of tissue or perhaps a certain type of flap, you tend to be in, within a, a ballpark. Even though the number is arbitrary, there is some consistency to it if you're on the same type of skin, for example. You, have, you, you typically land in the same uh, ballpark region. And when it comes to flap survivability, you have a pretty well established method of you know, anything going below a certain number or dropping a certain amount in a certain time frame, definitely something to be aware of and watch out for. But as an example, typically if I put this on my fingertip and I'll let the number stabilize here, you can be somewhere between 100 and 300 perfusion units oftentimes. If I go on the forearm skin, a normal level might be between 5 and 15 perfusion units. So just different types of skin can have very different levels of perfusion oftentimes. Now this probe has not yet been calibrated, but the probe itself can certainly be sterilized. The gas sterilization or a, a stereotype uh, sterilization method is, is preferred to ensure longevity of the probe itself. And being that the probe it is basically built up of optical fibers, it will be sensitive to kinking, uh, you know, bending the cable sharply, and also crushing damage as, you know, if the cable comes down on the ground potentially and somebody rolls it over with a, a cart or, or something else that might be all it takes to, to uh, to damage the probe. In some cases, we might be able to repair a damaged probe, so <laughs> please don't throw it out uh, if something goes wrong, but contact us and we'll see what we can do to at least troubleshoot and see what, uh, if there's a way to bring it back to life. Uh, but what often helps as far as keeping your probe serviceable for years to come is to ensure that the cable always stays out of harm's way, never get caught in any closing drawers, never get down on the ground where somebody might stumble or run over it. So keeping the cable out of harm's way is, is key for longevity of, of the probe. For calibration, we have this calibration device. Uh, calibration fluid, we call this motility standard. It's a suspension of small latex spares, 0.3 microns in size. And because we can control this, the concentration of these latex particles, we also then know what the probe should measure as we're dipping this into the, uh, the calibration solution, the motility standard. So to do this calibration, I'll empty this bottle into this little glass jar that comes in the calibration kit. If this fluid is in good shape, it should look almost like milk. Something like this. If you notice that the particles are separating and it looks more like a, a cup of water with a little white slurry in it, then it's not serviceable anymore. And the, uh, the bottle also does have a expiration date. So on occasion, you will need to re replace this, and you can get just this bottle for a replacement. This one expires June 2018, so they typically last a couple of years or so. For the calibration, uh, so what the, the probe actually measures in this fluid is uh, the Brownian motion of those little latex spheres, and it's a very sensitive measurement, and because it is so sensitive, I don't want to hold this by hand. Instead, I'm using this little clip to, to hold the probe in, in this fluid. And now what we want to see on the machine is a reading that's about 250, give or take 15 units. So between 235 and 265 is where we want to be. Right now we can see that it's just a little bit out of out of range and that would be the time to then calibrate this probe 
if you are now measuring in this liquid and you are between 235 and 265, you can then just pull it back out, wipe it off, and you're ready to go and ready to use this. In this case, I am going to calibrate. The most important thing when you do the calibration is to make sure that everything's perfectly vibration free. Being that we're measuring in the fluid, it's very sensitive to any bumps and, and vibrations, for example. And this is the only time you would hit calibrate? Yeah, only time. Again, if you do replace the probe, you check in the fluid, you're outside the range where you want to be, that would be a good time to calibrate. And the calibration process typically takes about a minute and a half or so. As the calibration is under, underway, the display flashes cal. When we're done, you will see a number in green, and then hopefully when that number settles in, it's going to be much closer to 250 than we were uh, previously. So we'll see now where it comes up to. So this needs to happen before every case? Not necessarily. No. Only if you swap out the probe. But since we don't know which probe was used in the procedure before, we're probably going to have to do it every case. Mm -hmm. So this comes sterile? This comes sterile. Mm -hmm. And then, how's, does it, how's that happen? It'll have to be something where we hand it off to the scrub and the scrub. How Is do that we do that? solution step? Perhaps not. Uh, I, mean, I, I think, think so. yeah. It's no, no, you calibrate. sterilize. You have, to pro you have to calibrate before you sterilize it. Yeah. So we would calibrate it, number it, and say for this particular yeah, okay. case, it's probe number one. We calibrated it right. to probe number one. So probes, this can happen the night before. Mm -hmm. The probes have. Um, now, that said, I would actually, the first thing I would check with all the probes you'll have in rotation but, is to, to plug them in one after the other and see how far, but how different they are. In clinical practice, we don't calibrate all the time, only if, uh, only if you feel like it's not reading well. Right. That's oh, like and, and that might be the case. If you check all the three probes and they're Because they're you're like close. 2 2.6, that's still good reading. Because you're looking for the consistency. Right. Okay. And you might find now if you have three probes, two of them read 250, give or take a little bit in the fluid, and one of them reads 95. Now, we might even look at swapping out that probe for a different one yeah. just to get you three that are very similar. And in that case, you probably don't have to calibrate more than twice a year or so. Okay. And I think that might probably be the easiest. Yeah, we, can, yeah. we can take all four probes and look at yeah. I think we have three right now. Let's see which one's out, the outlier. So do we store that solution in that little container? Now, uh, being that I, I put the, uh, the solution in the glass jar, you can secure this. Uh, this lid has a little bit of a film to keep it airtight, so it will, it will keep uh, throughout the expiration period of Oh, so you can just keep it like that. Yeah. It doesn't have to be... That would be... So you can, not, you can... Can we write the expiration date on that jar? That, we can order it's, more. It's in... Only you it's can on the bottle. Would they want yeah. it on the actual... Yeah. You yeah. typically don't yeah. really lose much fluid if when you're performing the calibration. Oh, okay. So, the, the biggest problem in my experience with the calibration fluid would be if somebody forgets to put the cap on it, just sits in open air for three days and maybe spills or maybe evaporates. So that might change things around. But if right. you do a calibration check like this and then immediately secure the lid back on, you're, you're fine. If we had multiple oh, modules maybe in the future on the same zero. machine. Dude, so if we had two modules on that machine, mm -hmm. let's say two years from now or whenever we, we do that, um, if we the probes with, are specific to the module or that machine? Like, is so be the probe and the module right, combination. Right. But again, I think that the easiest thing to do would be to, to see how they, if you swap the probes over, right. what kind of difference do you see from that? If the difference is minimal, then you don't have to worry about okay. it. So when you think about the calibration, you actually have to clean it. Yeah. Then you put in the solution if you want some dirty. We can do it the night before. Calibrate yeah. it and say for this case, just like we do our other stuff for yeah. this case. I don't case. think. I think if we number them, some will work with SPD somehow. I think we should just do it when ad hoc. I wouldn't do it each case. Um, yeah. I don't think that would be necessary. Yeah. 
Now, uh, also in the calibration device is this little uh, plastic cylinder. We call it the zero reference. And what we can do, the, the double-sided tape might come in handy there. So you can, you can make sure this way that the probe is in fact reading zero on something that's static or, or dead or non-moving. So we can take one of these little double-sided tape strips. I'm just going to put it right on top of the plastic block. Peel off the back here. Stick the probe down. And now our reading should be very, very close to zero. If for some reason it is not, that would also perhaps be a good time to calibrate. And this might even be more important in terms of flap monitoring, because if your zero offset is, is way off, then reading 10 on a flap might not mean what, what you think it typically means. So in this case, we're, we're 0.2 off, which is 0 0.1, 0 0.2, which is and if that was way so off, would it mean time to calibrate? Yes. So what, rather than wait for a patient, we could test that. Mm -hmm. what, what is that? What is it on right now? It's on a little plastic block. So this is basically what we call the zero zero flux. Yeah. Okay. And I just stuck that on there on a double-sided piece of tape. And when I'm when I'm satisfied with that reading, uh. I just peel this off here. So we will use that to check it and have it as close to zero as possible, and if it's far off, then we calibrate. Say, and realistically, yes. you guys shouldn't have to do any of that. It'll be something we take Yeah. Care. And it's got no slots for probes that you can stick in. Right, yeah, for different probes. models of probes, correct. So the, does it fit in a groove? Is there a groove for our? No, no you would fit. just stick it on a solid uh, piece of surface for that probe. So uh -huh. this probe has a... Uh, basically, the, the fibers are coming in yeah. parallel to the tissue in question, so they're going right. through a little turn and yeah. they have aperture here. Uh -huh. Some other probes have a, a straight tip approach. Like There's a picture there. Like, like on, on the picture, right? Uh, you can bury those. It's like a drench tube. Oh, yeah? It's just a good sign. Do you, so, do you always use this probe or do you ever use the other one? I want to use that probe. Just this one. Because I'm exteriorizing. Because you're always exteriorizing. If you don't, and the flap's completely buried, then you can use that one. Then, you, then when you're done, you pull them out. Yeah. This probe is very, very yeah. nice you, to you use that with, with that with skin okay. because you can't come in. And it's not really in the way as much as a probe that's coming in perpendicular uh, might be. So Sam, what other stuff does our, like, we have 10 minutes. What other stuff would our nurses or biomedical department need to know as far as troubleshooting aside from writing down the code, looking in the manual? That is pretty much it as, as far as I can think of right now. And then uh, just processing of the actual probe, once we do have it calibrated, mm -hmm. it would be stare at, is there a certain temperature or? Yes, and it, the manual will state this and I can probably find the page that is on. Is there battery battery life to this too? So transporting to the ICU? It does not have a battery. Okay. So it does need a power plug. It does have. So we just have to document the number before we leave PACU, and then when we plug it in, document that number in ICU. I'm guessing. The probe itself is mm -hmm. documented. Well, I think as we're doing it, but they'll. I think what they're seeing in the OR, they'll kind of tell us, "Hey, this is what I'm seeing." Is right. that how? It, so you have times, to unplug it. A lot of times uh, when the patient goes to the ICU, the numbers changes because under anesthesia, okay. they are hyperperfuse. The numbers can be higher. Okay. When okay. they go to the recovery room or the ICU, the anesthesia is off. Right. And the patient is waking up a little bit. Mm -hmm. They may have more spasms. So the numbers okay. change a lot. Yeah. It's not okay. always exact. Okay. Okay, awesome. It's going to vary a little bit. Right. So it's just a part of the assessment. It's right. not the entire. Do you, do you need a new sticker for Dr. Tan? I think uh, yeah, I got you. Because his readings were... It's my years of smoking. <laughs> <laughs> Clinically, I don't use the tape. I just use the sutures much, much better. So you had to put the... Oh, so you had to put the tegadrum on first and then... 
Is this, is, this, is, this is a double double sided tape? Yeah, in real life we suture it. Okay. But uh, I'm taping it because I don't want to suture your finger. <laughs> Alright, thank you. <laughs> Whenever you're ready. So does this affect the reading? The, yes. Uh, it yes. should, right? Yeah. But tape itself shouldn't affect much on the substance once it's clear. Uh, okay, so... We, uh, do you know if it's going to be operated in this problem? Yes. By cat, he said he calibrated, right? Yes, as far as I know. Okay. I know that for me it was reading at 200. Oh, okay, on your finger? Yeah, on my yeah. finger it was reading at That's 200. That's pretty normal fingertip reading. So how do you guys turn this on and how, you, you know, so these are, the, these are the cables? Right, so the cable. It's not disposable. Okay. <laughs> so you go pull it out and you have to push in. So red with red, black with whatever. Right, man. black yeah. and black. So they come in two of them. Is that correct? Yeah, it's transmitting and receiving. Okay. And then so it's like a lure lock. You push in and turn. Okay. And you, that's all you need to do. You don't have to calibrate it, turn it up, or uh, calibrate if you replace the probe. And I'll go over those okay. uh, details. Yeah, but basically, when you're working with the monitor, you don't want to push the calibrate. Okay. Because no. you have to have the uh, proper solution to calibrate it. Okay. There's 16. It's not very good. Not good, isn't it? <laughs> I'll tell you. All the calluses, Doc. It's all the years of hard living. Yeah. <laughs> hard living. <laughs> you get a little hyper response. response. Mm -hmm. Now let's occlude it partially. Yeah, trying to mimic uh, Venus. That's not really Venus, 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 Venus turkey. Unfortunately. I'm going to tie it. Of course, this is... be a little, I guess, a little loose. Not it well. Now, Jim, when they have to go mobilizing, they, you just leave it on and disconnect mm -hmm. yeah, it and, and, and then walk around with it? Usually I'll curl it up and tape it to the bottom. Mm -hmm. See, notice this is Venus? Yeah. It's dropping. See, the cap you feel is one second. So the numbers drop. It is. Thank you. It's pretty neat. Why? I'd love to see what so this is. So I'm in making a, to the a Venus exclusion well. here. See, the cap you feel is one second. <laughs> yeah, it's purple. It's not good. <laughs> so Venus can just fly. <laughs> what? So now it goes back up. It's pretty quick. It's pretty neat. Yeah. Now if I clot it completely, yeah. Yeah. No, it's just micro cases. You don't need that finger, do you, Doctor? <laughs> <laughs> so that's a little tighter. We're trying yeah. to mimic uh, arterial now. It's nice pretty quick. Yeah, with arterial, it's going to drop. Precipitously down. Okay, so, so this, this can be sterilized and brought onto the field. Right? Yes. In fact, if you're careful with it, this will last over 10 laps.